Welcome back. Now, investigators have revealed new information about the crash of the Virgin Galactic spacecraft. They say a safety device designed to slow it down on re-entry activated early during that fatal test flight. But they say it is still too soon to tell if that's why the craft broke apart on Friday. Well, debris has been scattered in seven separate places across the desert in California. Well, let's... Uh, Talk about it with uh, Per Wimmer, who's uh, already bought his ticket to be one of the first on board Virgin Galactic. Uh, he's also a friend of the family of the Virgin founder, Sir Richard Branson. And thank you so much for coming in to talk to us. I said that you are a friend of, uh, of uh, Richard Branson. Have you had conversations since the events over the weekend? Uh, no, I haven't. I, I think they have more on their plate uh, to, to focus on, and, and that has the first priority has got to be with the uh, the test pilots' families. I mean, that has got to be number one priority, and I know that Richard cares very, very much about that. So um, that's that's why that's why we start. Uh, I was I lost my dad last week uh, as well, so I know how it must feel to to lose somebody. Um, but and in, Richard Branson uh, uh, said in every interview has made exactly that point. But in terms of uh, what were your first thoughts when you heard, when you saw those scenes that we were just showing? It was tragic. It was like a dagger through my heart. Um, I really felt, oh no. It was a shock. It was really a shock, a tragic shock. I had, uh, we didn't expect it. We, are, we, we were the last part of the test program, so we were actually getting very excited to, to go into space. Uh, but space is a tough business. Uh, it is hard, and it does take a, take a lot of uh, uh, efforts. And those developments we heard, uh, these are not firm conclusions, these are very early thoughts, but uh, it was quite interesting the detail we heard today about this, this feathering system. Just for, for anyone who doesn't really understand how these things work, what, what are we talking about here? What, what potentially could have gone wrong here with that? Uh, well, first of all, in terms of what could have gone wrong, it's difficult to, to speculate because the investigators really need to do their job. But let me explain how a space flight works uh, with, with Spaceship Two. Uh, you fly up on, 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 uh, underneath the mothership, it detaches, the rocket then ignites and takes you all the way up to space. We then float around there for some time, and once we've seen the Earth, taken the beautiful pictures, we then head back into the atmosphere, and in order to break, part of the spaceship then goes up like this and, and it will then break. It's like a shuttlecock. It will basically break the speed and slow down the speed so that when we hit re-entry, it'll be a lot slower. I was making the point earlier, is that, just in layman's speak, is that like slamming on the brakes when you're going at full speed? Yeah, kind of. Uh, well, uh, yeah, sort of. I mean, you, you've got to break somehow. The atmosphere, once you go back into the atmosphere, that will provide some break just through friction. But in order to assist that braking process, you put on the feathering mechanism and that will break it on the way down. There have been problems right through this process. I mean, it's cutting egg, edge technology, obviously, but there have been problems and the timeline has slipped back and particularly problems around the whole fuel system, hasn't it? And then they've been using uh, and turned to plastics. It is true there has been delays on the way, and I think uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Safety has got to be the first and foremost priority uh, for, for everybody, both for Virgin Galactic, for us as astronauts, we want to see this as a safe experience. So, so taking longer time is, is, actually, is actually a good thing. Per, I'll come back to you in a moment, but uh, we've just uh, got our line to Washington to uh, talk also to Marco Kakeras, who's uh, Director of Space Studies at Teal Group, who, who work with many of the big aerospace companies as well as NASA. Welcome to the programme. We were talking there to one man who still hopes to actually make a mission. What do you think the events of the last couple of days flag up to you? Well, I think the, uh, the accident on Friday uh, signals to me that we've begun. This process of, uh, of flight testing doesn't come without uh, tremendous risk and this is true whether it's um, space travel or whether it's uh, aircraft or, or train or automobile travel. Uh, these uh, incidents are going to happen. People are going to die. Uh, we're at the very beginning of a, of, a, of a new industry and so I think this is normal. I think the important thing is that, uh, is that we learn from uh, every incident and that we um, and we take it slowly we, we don't put the uh, the cart before the horse what do you mean exactly by taking it slowly is there do you have any concern that perhaps the pace of getting to the flight stage has happened too quickly no I think I think it's important to fly more I think uh, if you look at the the number of flights of this uh, system uh, both the the carrier aircraft and and the space plane itself 
um, I think we, we've uh, uh, launched about 54 uh, flights in all, but only four of them are powered flights. And so I think, if anything, it, uh, it signals that uh, perhaps there should be more powered flights uh, before we even start talking about uh, the idea of, of, of uh, launching passengers into space. Virgin, of course, had an explosion on the ground back in 2007. There have been some that were urging the FAA to press the pause button then. When you look back and reflect, would that have been a good idea to, to, to actually pause things, look at exactly how this was being done? Well, well I'm, I'm fairly sure that Virgin Galactic looked at, at, uh, at, at that accident and and, uh, and studied it carefully and, and decided, uh, and, and in fact did slow things down. If you, if you look back at the history of this program, uh, Mr. Branson has been saying since uh, 2008 that uh, uh, launching uh, passengers is just around the corner next year. Every year uh, it's next year and I think he, he's raised expectations and, that, and that's fine, uh, but I don't think necessarily that he's, he's pushed um, uh, too much. I think in fact uh, he, he, could have, um, he could have had more test flights because ultimately you can only do so much on the ground. Uh, again, this is a, this is a, a risky business, and uh, if anything, uh, you probably need to be doing more test flights rather than less. Marco, thanks for that insight. Uh, per, let's uh, return to you, because I said the, in our introduction you've already bought your ticket. It's at enormous expense. Do you think this is actually going to go ahead? I mean, it is very clearly a tragic setback, but possibly is it also the end of this whole notion of space tourism? Not at all. Once the dust settles and, and, and the investigation has already taken place and lessons are learned and the uh, good engineers from Virgin Galactic has had a chance to rectify some of that, I have no doubt in my mind that the mission will continue. And I continue to share that, that vision about private space. No doubt. Well, well, no doubt at all. When we try to push the boundaries of private space as pioneers, it is inherently a risky business to do that for mankind, if you like. But that's the price of pushing the frontier of, of innovation, as it were. But we have got to continue the mission. It would also be letting so down in the... one sentence, though. Why is it so important that ordinary people get into space, not just scientists? Why, why is that so important? It's, it's the nature of uh, human exploration. We have always been looking around the world, and, and the world is kind of discovered now. So as, as an adventurer and pioneer, space is truly the new frontier, and we have got to continue to explore that. Per Wimmer, thank you so much for coming in to talk to us. Uh, well, uh, just uh, some of the issues uh, there that have uh, come out of that crash on Friday. Let's go to our correspondent who's there in the desert, uh, David Willis. Uh, and David, uh, those investigators very quickly were talking about uh, possible things that have gone wrong here. W what is the latest uh, where you are? Well, Matthew, you're absolutely right. Uh, the focus now seems to be on these so-called feathers or wings on the spacecraft. Uh, the acting chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board, that's the main ag agency looking into this uh, crash, said that it appeared that they had been deployed uh, prematurely. They're normally activated when the uh, spacecraft re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. But he said that uh, cockpit video showed that uh, a co-pilot had moved one of the levers. He did go on to stress, though, that it was too early to apportion blame, too early to reach conclusions. This will be a painstaking and thorough inquiry. It could take months, possibly as long as a year. And I suppose uh, their great advantage is to have the co-pilot, one of the pilots uh, who potentially can give them that absolutely graphic first-hand account. You're absolutely right. Peter Siebold, he's uh, sitting up uh, in hospital talking to doctors, we hear, and he is an extremely experienced pilot. This is a man who qualified as a pilot at the age of 16, which is the youngest you can possibly qualify, and uh, he has been connected with this program here in the Mojave Desert uh, more or less since its inception. So Peter Siebold will, as you say, have absolutely vital evidence uh, to provide the investigators with. David, David Willis, thanks very much for the latest there from the crash site. Thank you. On to other news.